Sean Haverson here, discussing for advanced trauma theory, the paramedic's ability to treat airway oxygenation and ventilation within the scope of practice and national standard curriculum. Our objectives today really circle around the idea of being able to recognize the need to use different tools. We're gonna to give you all the tools as a paramedic student as needed, being able to identify which tools are necessary and how to use those tools for advantages, disadvantages, indications, contraindications. And then discussing the need for assessment of our trauma patients, airway oxygenation and ventilation status. Now this is quite a long lecture by itself. So it's been broken up into four different parts so that we can allow for a bit shorter video time. Um, why don't we get started right off the bat. So the first part is going to be our preparatory section for airway, looking at the structure, function, uh, anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology of the airway. So some things to keep in mind for airway management. You have to know airway anatomy and physiology, and you have to know it like the back of your hand. Hopefully you know your back of your hand pretty well. Associate symptoms with pathology. So we need to be able to look at mechanisms and trauma. And a lot of this also applies to medical as well, but being able to look at those things and determine what is necessary for a patient, what's going on in these diseases, because that will help you identify which tools to use. And knowing which management tool appropriate for each patient um, is essential in being successful. So we'll start off with some terminology. So we need to look at the terms for inspiration and exhalation, or I prefer um, inhalation and exhalation. So when we're looking at these mechanisms, we need to really break it down to the entire process and all of the things that are involved in that process. So this is a diagram from one of your textbooks uh, showing a few different things that I'm going to actually add to. But I'll, let's focus on this center portion here um, where we show a nice little tool that shows us how pressures are going to change. So if we're looking at this, we can say that this is essentially a bottle. And the bottle here has a um, false bottom. And it's if you want to build something like this on your own, this is the diaphragm. It's basically just a piece of rubber around it with a little pull, pull tab. And on the inside is a straw here with a balloon, just a, a regular balloon and that marks the lungs. And so if we were to take this device, if we were to make this device and take it, um, what we would find is that we have pressure gradients, right? So we're going to see that when we have gradients of pressure, um, things are going to generally move from areas of higher concentration, right, higher concentration, to areas of lower concentration. So for us, that's going to equal really pressures. That's our gradient, right? So that's just a, a normal thing we've talked about. So when we're looking at this, we want to compare the ambient or outside air, right, and how it's concentrated. So remember, these square brackets generally show concentration and the inside of the chest cavity, which for us is the lungs. So a few things happen. So we need to identify what muscles are utilized and then the pressure changes when we have uh, inhalation and exhalation. So let's start with inhalation. So if you take a deep breath right now, we'll go ahead and do it. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Notice something about that. When you breathe in, do it again, and notice when you breathe in versus when you breathe out, how long that time period is, right? So breathing in and breathing out, um, I would ask you to answer what is the longer phase, inhalation or exhalation? So when you do that, exhalation should be your longer phase. And that phase is generally a one to two inhalation, exhalation, or it could be extracted a little bit more appropriately for us, two to three. And that's essentially in seconds, right? 
in seconds. Okay, so a few things happen when you inhale. When you take a deep breath in, as we see here, the diaphragm contracts. Diaphragm contracts, which means that it moves downward. My arrows are a little bit off today, but that's okay. So you do need to know when asked on a test question, what happens to the diaphragm, both muscularly and movement. So when the diaphragm contracts, it forces the abdominal contents here down. And at the same time, this outward movement here of the chest, take a deep breath in again and feel your chest. It moves up and out at the same time primarily. This is a little bit limited. So the way that this portion happens, so diaphragm contracts and moves down. Again, diaphragm contracts and moves down. The intercostal muscles, specifically your external, so we're going to stay kind of here in exhalation, external uh, intercostal muscles are going to contract. And the contraction takes your ribs, here they are, the muscles right there, and when it contracts, it brings these ribs closer together. And the net effect of all the ribs doing that are they all move upwards and outwards. And if you notice, when you take a deep breath in, your chest moves up like towards your head. And so that means that your lungs actually cross outside of the clavicle and they make their way into this neck muscle. That's important for trauma. Okay. Now, the final piece. So number one, we've got the diaphragm changing. Number two, we have intercostal muscles. And number three, we're going to see that that changes the volume inside the chest. So that's a cavity. So when we open up the size of the volume, that's what all of this muscle did. When we open up the size of the volume, that's going to create a negative pressure inside the chest compared to the outside. So negative versus positive, right? So inside of the chest. This is negative pressure ventilation. Negative pressure ventilation. Okay, that negative, so let's put that here. So a whole bunch of negatives in here. And this is more positive out here. And that effect is positive. So we remember our rule here, higher pressure to lower pressure. Higher pressure, air rushes in to lower pressure, lower pressure, okay. So I'm going to wrap that part up. Inhalation. What happens when you take a deep breath in? And if you're on a test and you can't figure this out, just take a deep breath. It'll calm you down, increase blood flow uh, to your brain and all sorts of fun things. And if you're sniffing that oxygen-producing plant in class, perhaps it'll help you. Anyways, uh, so the things that occur. So what ends up happening is when you take a deep breath in, the diaphragm contracts and it also moves down. So you need to know both of those parts. At the same time, we're going to have number two, external intercostal muscles. Intercostal muscles contract, and that brings the chest up and out, right? So maybe up and outward, chest wall. When that happens, it increases the volume of the chest, and the inside of the chest is more negative, more negative, than the outside, which is more positive. And that allows for our diffusion of pressures to work. All right, now let's look at uh, exhalation. I don't like this term personally in emergency medicine, exhalation. Okay, so same kind of rules. We're gonna start with the diaphragm. The diaphragm relaxes, and when the diaphragm relaxes, it moves back up. And why does it move back up when it relaxes? What, what's the mechanism? It's not muscle that's contracting. We pushed all of these abdominal contents down here, and so there's pressure inside the abdomen, and that forces it up. Okay. At the same time, your intercostal muscles, to kind of compare, intercostal muscles relax. And when they relax, this moves back into the space. So this volume was previously negative until it filled. And we get to a point of basically equilibrium. And when that occurs and the person, ex the person exhales, this volume gets smaller. But the gas that was inside there was the same amount. 
but we force the container to get smaller. So that causes the inside of the lungs to become more positive in pressure compared to the outside. And then our diffusion property is things move from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure concentration. Excellent. So let's put that here. Three. The inside of the chest is more positive versus the outside world being more negative. And that allows for that movement. Now, this is not positive pressure ventilation, though, because positive pressure ventilation, which you do, so let me just kind of put that here because I don't want to put it under our exhalation. Positive pressure ventilation is when you create this positive such a degree higher than the inside of the chest that it forces the chest wall to open. So that's the use of your BVM or ventilator when we get to that level. Okay, so just going to restate on an exam the mechanics of breathing or mechanics of, all right, so just remember this is the movement of gases, right? So mechanics of ventilation. This doesn't have much to do with respiration yet. So when this occurs, uh, if we're starting with inspiration, the person's going to breathe in. And when they breathe in like that, they cause the diaphragm to contract. Say it with me. The diaphragm contracts and it moves down. The external intercostal muscles contract and they move out and up. And that causes a vacuum, which means the inside of the lungs is more negative versus the outside air, which is more positive, and air rushes into the lungs. All right, well, let's look at exhalation. And exhalation, say it with me. Same thing, we'll start with diaphragm. The diaphragm relaxes, and it moves up because of the abdominal contents pushing on it. When it moves up, also, the intercostal muscles will relax, and they move back inward and that causes the inside of the chest to become more positive because we took the same amount of air same volume but we changed the size of the container a smaller container that increases pressure and so that causes air to move out of the body and all of this happens at our ratio of two to three that's what I prefer. And when you look at two to three, the reason I give you that is because if it's two seconds in and three seconds out, look at this. That's five seconds, right? If you're ventilating for somebody, one, two, in, one, two, three, out, that's five seconds for one cycle. And if you do that in one minute, what's going to be five seconds in one minute over time? will basically be 12 ventilations. So that's a very good ventilatory rate, ventilatory rate for us. So when you're performing your skills, two seconds in, three seconds out. So when you tell the proctor, I'm ventilating at a rate of 12, they can count that your IE ratio is showing two to three, and five times 12, let's just do some math because that's what you love to do, is 60, which is one minute. Excellent. So I do need you to have that bit of information down, okay? One thing I want to add here, and it's a little bit more towards the medical realm. I'm going to add um, another idea down here. So let me just put a little asterisk. If you have to forcefully exhale, right? So this is passive. Exhalation is passive. Muscles aren't working. Ventilation uh, with inhalation phase is going to be active right? Muscle use, no muscle use. So when we look at this, if you have to forcefully exhale, forcefully exhale, you're going to use internal intercostal muscles to do that. And that's not normal. And those muscles are not very well built. Your uh, intercostal external muscles are pretty well built, but internal intercostals are not well built. So let's think about this. What I want you to do, let's actually act it out. You're going to take a deep breath in, just like we did, two seconds in, count it out, three seconds out. And at the end of the three seconds, when you feel like your lungs are comfortably empty, I want you to forcefully exhale as hard as you can. All the, like get all, squeeze all the air out. 
So here's what you do. Let's do it. Breathing in. Breathe out. Now that you're exhaled, forcefully exhale as much as you can. Kind of like the gut punch. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear that. Well, that contraction involved a bunch of different muscles, but that contraction, breathing out, uh, exhaling out, is primarily internal intercostal muscles. So when the person is having a hard time exhaling because of maybe uh, bronchial constriction, they're having to fight against the air getting out, they turn a normally passive process of exhalation into an active process, which means they're using more energy to breathe than they did before. So the benefit of getting oxygen in might be overwhelmed by the idea that to exhale, they have to use energy which they otherwise wouldn't. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So some notes on the function of the respiratory system, probably not new to you, but um, we need to know where gas exchange occurs. So we would call that external respiration, right? So let's kind of do maybe a uh, AKA, AKA external respiration. So that's going to occur in the alveoli. How does CO2 affect ventilation? So why don't we go ahead and answer that for me? How does CO2 affect ventilation? So your answer should be somewhere uh, within the, the realm of um, CO2 impacts ventilation because it is our primary drive to take a deep breath and exhale on the other side of it. And so that's something that from basic world is associated with the hypoxic drive versus the carbonic drive. Uh, drive. We probably heard about that with COPD, right? Never give a COPD a bunch of ox patient a bunch of oxygen. Uh, they'll stop breathing. Okay, so the carbonic drive is measuring using chemoreceptors inside your body and inside your brain. Uh, more on that in your respiratory block and a little bit in human systems. But it's using those chemoreceptors, chemoreceptor that's going to be chemicals, and they're measuring pH, and the mechanism measuring pH is going to be associated with CO2, and when the person is measuring their CO2, when CO2 gets to a certain level, they are basically told, they tell their lungs, to go ahead and start breathing. Now, the byproduct is that they'll bring in oxygen, but really what they're trying to do is blow off CO2. You remember that? Blowing off CO2. And in our COPD patient, this is primary, right? Well, one with the circle over it is primary. And this is secondary. This is a backup. This means, hypoxic means that the carbonic drive wasn't working, and now they're only breathing based on a lack of oxygen, which means that they have a general lack of oxygen. And on top of the lack of oxygen, they have a, 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 a buildup of CO2. And so our ventilatory drive is impacted by CO2. The faster we breathe, probably the more CO2 our body is trying to breathe off, which is part of our buffer system. Good. So looking at upper airway anatomy. So you should, you should be able to follow a O2 or CO2 molecule through the whole respiratory tract, right? So all of our airways, and that's an EMT basic level. But we can see a couple structures here, just a reminder. Here our turbinates and conchi are going to create turbulence. Here, that's what I'm drawing. So when air is brought into the nose, it holds it. That turbulence is to increase temp, or regulate temp, basically, and to increase humidity. An immune system function is it's going to allow that air to hang out so that we can remove we can remove particles 
that we don't want in the lungs. And remember that as air goes into the lungs, the alveoli are a single uh, cell thickness. And so if we have really cold or we have really dry uh, air making its way into the lungs, it's probably going to cause fracturing of those cells and that would impede our ventilation. So we want to also identify why is the tongue so problematic in trauma or altered mental status. We'll just put altered mental status here. Well, the tongue is this huge muscle. If you've ever um, looked at a cow muscle, it is a cow tongue. It is gigantic, and that's the same idea. So what ends up happening, though, is this huge chunk of muscle when the person's laying on their back, so that would be in the supine position, the tongue falls back and occludes this part of the airway. And it results in what sound? Anybody remember? Easy. Snoring, right? When that occurs. I do expect you to know all of the structures of the upper airway. The lower airway is a little bit simpler uh, in structures. We have a few things I'll point out here. Number one is I want to identify that the, before we get to these questions, the division, the dividing point between upper and lower airway is going to equal the larynx, right? And that is where your vocal cords are. That's the divi dividing point be uh, be between upper and lower airways. So when we're looking at this set of pictures, or this picture, it's very simplistic. Um, this, oh, let's not do that. This is going to be your cricothyroid member, member, uh, structure. So the thyroid is primarily this structure here, and then the cricoid is down here, and we'll get more to that in a little bit. This is the trachea, right, trachea. This is the bifurcation, and I don't necessarily know if I like the way this picture is, because this right side, this is right, this is patient's left, this right side is actually, oh, I didn't do it well, is straighter than this side. And that's because the heart is accommodated here. And we also notice we have three lobes on this side and two lobes on this side of the lungs. So not only will we have this, but the bifurcation point here, the bifurcation point is the carina. You do need to know that. If you're feeling your chest, if you bring your finger down the trachea until you feel the sternal notch, the sternal notch is somewhere about here, the manubrium, and just behind that is going to be the carina. So it's something to think about because um, different from our supraglottic airways, a tube goes into the trachea, and we don't want it to go just on one side because when it inflates, it would cut off the uh, other side from getting oxygen from that distal end. All right, so then we've got our bronchi, left and right, bronchioles, or bronchioles, and alveoli. Excellent. Now have to forgive my pen here, it's getting a little crazy. All right, so we have conduction, conduction, and then we have respiration zones, or regions, I like zones. Conduction zones are our airways the airways. No oxygen is exchanged or CO2 through this tissue. It occurs in the alveoli through the capillaries. That's our exchange region. Some more anatomy for us, just a bit of a refresher again. We do have a pleural space, and so pleural space is a potential space, potential space. That means that it's a very small space initially, but if there's a hole in this, it can accumulate stuff. So that might be air, or that could be red blood cells, red blood cells, or bleeding into that space. So uh, as I alluded to in previous lectures, the inside of the chest wall is basically that shiny material. It's a membrane, that shiny material that's on the underside of ribs if you're eating ribs of an animal. That is the parietal pleura. And then the membrane covering an organ is visceral, and that's our visceral pleura. Uh, 
Okay, so this is a depiction of a disease. So we have uh, air accumulating, air accumulating in the pleural space. So what would that be called? That would be our pneumothorax. Yes, pneumothorax. And that, of course, collapses the lungs because the ribs aren't collapsible. So the air causes the collapsing of the lungs, which decreases the amount of uh, space that air can be conducted through. Simple stuff, but it, again, a reminder that we need to cover. This is just a really nice picture showing how packed uh, the inside of the cavities are. So here's our sternum. Right, and we're right at the point of the, just above the heart, and then we've got our vertebrae. So, you know, when you're doing chest compressions, you're pushing on this to push downward up against this, and you're moving blood through those spaces. Uh, reminder of pulmonary arteries versus pulmonary veins. Um, tell me, if you would, what is the movement of blood from the heart when it's going through a pulmonary artery versus a pulmonary vein? So the pulmonary artery, you can think, so someone may have taught you it's reverse in the heart as far as what an artery does. It's actually not. Um, arteries, it's, it's too simplistic. We can fix that. So arteries always take heart uh, blood away from the heart. Away. Right? Makes sense, the aorta going away from the heart. Veins, blood to the heart. Okay, so if we use that definition, arteries go away and veins go to, we can easily identify which way the blood is going. So our pulmonary artery carries, this is a point of specific knowledge, it doesn't, artery doesn't mean by default that there's oxygenated blood, actually. It just means that it's moving away. So that tells us that if it's moving away from the heart into the lungs, that it's deoxygenated blood, correct? Now, veins always go back to the heart. They don't necessarily always carry deoxygenated blood. So if we go back to the heart as our primary definition for a vein, then we would identify that oxygenated blood returns to the heart to leave the aorta, which carries blood away because it's the largest artery. And at that point, it is oxygenated blood. So don't think too simplistic so that you are not messing up or, or kind of flipping these terms. All right. Here's really where we want to know a lot of information. Um, because in your journey to paramedic school, what we're going to teach you for airway is one of the sexy things that you probably came to paramedic school for, is to intubate uh, your patients and being able to essentially save them in the case where a superglottic airway or BVM is ineffective. So there's, there's a lot of this slide going on. And just um, for a note, this is on page um, 714. Let me find a place here. Page 714 of Nancy Caroline's textbook, and it is figure two for you to reference as well. So if you printed this out in black and white or something, you can go back to the book for full color. Okay, so we got this structure down pretty well. I think we're okay with this structure. What we want to look at now is this structure here. So this is the cricothyroid. This is the thyroid structure, um, a.k.a. Adam's apple, a.k.a. Eve's apple, because women have it as well. So when we're looking at this, something that we do need to identify is your hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is one of the few bones in the body that's not connected to another bone. It's free-floating. Now, it does have cartilage, but its role, essentially, is to anchor the tongue and the cartilage of the epiglottis together. And that's important because one of our tools is going to manipulate the tongue, which will manipulate the epiglottis. So it's an indirect manipulation. And it's only possible because of the hyoid bone. So this is going to be a view here of looking directly at the patient's anterior. Right? That's the patient's anterior. So the thyroid ligament you really can't feel. But this structure here the structure here is going to be the thyroid cartilage, and that you can feel. That's the Adam's apple. Just underneath is the cricoid, the cricoid cartilage. 
So some definitions here we want to add. So the cricoid versus the rings of the trachea, the cricoid is the only fully circular cartilage of the trachea. All the other tracheal cartilages, as you can feel, the, rib, the, the ribs down your trachea, are C-shaped. So that's kind of important because that helps us manipulate airways a little bit. Now what I want you to do is take your finger and you're going to place your finger on yourself on the Adam's apple and use your index finger. Now bring your index finger down and when you bring your index finger down it's going to rest in this little depression and what's underneath the pad of your thing, finger is the cricoid cartilage and where your finger is sitting is the cricothyroid membrane. So it's a membrane that connects the cricoid and the thyroid. This is essential to be able to identify because this is where we're going to surgically cut so that we can uh, perform a surgical or open uh, uh, cricothyrotomy, right, or a crike. So that's important. Now I want you to take a moment and you're going to do the exact same thing with your index finger on the anterior portion of the person sitting next to you and find that Adam's apple or Eve's apple proper. Now once you find it, bring your finger down and I want you to, to stop as soon as the pad of your finger rests on the thyroid I'm sorry, the cricoid, and where your point, the point of your, the tip of your finger is pointing is the cricothyroid membrane. Good. Now find somebody else in class to do that, the partner on your other side. Great. It is absolutely essential that you are able to identify the structure. I want you to do it with your eyes closed at some point. Identifying the structure is what will be the probably greatest percentage of being successful in a crike. And we'll get to a crike in a minute, but this means the patient will die if you don't do this. And there's no backup tool for it. Another side of this picture I want to highlight, though, um, is certainly we just looked at uh, this portion here, so anterior. This is a posterior to anterior view of this right so let's kind of look at this nasopharynx there's the conchi there's your septum right down the center um, this is going to be the posterior portion um, of the nasopharynx this is your uvula back there is the tongue and some tonsils and then here we have the opening down into uh, the patient's um, airway, and this will be basically the start of the epiglottis. Excellent. One tube goes into, <clears throat> excuse me, the airway, and since we're looking posterior, this, and it shows a bit of muscle here, some striations, this is going to be the esophagus, right, because more anterior kind of looking that way, is the trachea. Great. Now, you're not going to see these structures, but it's important to identify this view because of the primarily the epiglottis uh, and our esophagus. So really good views. we got a lot of pictures here to look at. All right. So now we're looking at your field of vision. If you're basically putting in a laryngoscope blade and visualizing the airway. So I want to kind of give reference. This is going to be anterior here. This is going to be posterior down here. All right, anterior and posterior. So when we're looking at these structures, we've got some very specific structures we need to know. True vocal cords. That's important because the true vocal cords are where you're going to insert the tube. And if you look in here, you can see the rings of the trachea. Okay, 
The false vocal cords, sometimes you can only see the false vocal cords, de depending on how much of this you can view. And unfortunately, the false vocal cords, although they don't look the same here, sometimes the sheen of light can actually make them look like true vocal cords. So the vocal cords are these ligaments here that will vibrate when the person talks. Okay, The vestibular fold separates, the vestibular fold separates, true and false vocal cords. Okay. What I want you to also know here is obviously the glottic opening, which is the specific area where you insert your tube. You want to be able to identify the corniculate cartilage and the cuneiform cartilage, and then also the airy, uh, airy, uh, epiglottic fold. Um, because these are structures that you may only be able to see a part of to help visualize where the tube is going, right? And then this is what your epiglottis would essentially look like, okay? So the things I've underlined here, I do want you to know um, as structures. Sometimes the tubercle of the epiglottis is maybe one of the few things you see, right? Because as you visualize, the field of view would be down here is posterior, so you're esophagus, but your esophagus doesn't look open. It's usually kind of flattened and very difficult to see. And passing the tube into the, uh, the esophagus is fatal for your patient if not recognized, right? Because it has a cuff on it. It closes off the esophagus. You ventilate through the tube, not BVM, so there's no passive hypopharyngeal airway, all that good stuff. It goes directly through the tube. So if it goes in the stomach, we have some complications. Great. So some just terms here for us. So the vollecula. Uh, let me back up and show you the vollecula here. So it's not really, uh, yeah, it's not really identified in this picture, but the vollecula is this space here. This is the vollecula. Let me bring this down here. Vollecula. And the vollecula is the space between the epiglottis and the tongue, so it would be more anterior to the epiglottis uh, than it is to the tongue, essentially. Okay, So that's important because that is a, a landmark of where we're going to insert a specific blade. All right. So as it is here, important landmark for endotracheal intubation. I can tell you right off the bat, that's testable. The retinoid cartilages are going to be the posterior attachment of the vocal cords, and they can be a valuable visual guide for endotracheal intubation. Okay. Piriform, the piriform fossa uh, is going to be a area where occasionally our devices can be inserted into the pockets. And going back a few slides here, we've got the, the recess um, and the fossa is essentially this space in here. And the problem with that is if you're pushing your tube into that, it's going to cause trauma to soft tissue and this area will bleed. So if your airway wasn't bleeding initially, now it may fill up with blood, unfortunately. A term here for us, laryngospasm. So it's a spasmodic closure of the vocal cords, and so they would be from that open position now to closed. And when they spasm, you can't pass a tube through that space without causing significant damage. Reasons for laryngospasm will be trauma to the site. So trauma to the larynx. So you may start passing the tube and bouncing off of all these other structures with a really sloppy set of techniques. And unfortunately, when you do that, it prompts a laryngospasm. And if you recall a th an idea, it's not necessarily just a theory, um, as we think like, oh, it's I think it's something. This is something that's true and proven. And so what ends up happening in a patient who is drowning while they're awake. When they drown while they're awake, their lungs are dry because of the laryngospasm. So water in the gag reflex cause laryngospasm to occur. And it's not necessarily easily reversed with our tools. All right. 
So looking at surfactant as a term, so surfactant is a a, uh, a, a fluid um, that is secreted into the alveolar space, and surfactant's role is pretty important. So through its mechanism, it's going to hold open um, or allow for the opening of our alveolar structures. And so you'll learn a little bit more about that and the things that um, decrease the amount of surfactant in that space. But essentially what surfactant does is decreases the surface tension so that we can allow for the alveoli to open and close. Atelectasis as a term, so hopefully you're writing that down in your notes. Atelectasis as a term is going to be the collapsing of alveoli. And alveoli can be thought of very easily and superficially as a balloon. So if you take a brand new balloon and you try to inflate it, just kind of th think of this idea. You blow into this little tiny balloon that the kid gives you, and you're blowing in and blowing in it. And to get the thing to just inflate a little bit, you got veins popping out of your, your head, you got uh, shortness of breath, you're, you've got dizziness, all to try and get this thing open. But then once you start inflating it past that collapse point, uh, as long as you don't let the air escape, you can give it to the kid and they can finish blowing it up generally. So that's kind of the way the alveoli work. Once they're collapsed, it's much harder for them to expand and fill again. And so atelectasis is the collapsing of the alveoli. Maybe I should write, I'll write that down for you. So this decreases surface tension. It's a fluid. It's a, you can think of it as almost a lubricant. And this is collapsed alveoli. Great. Causes of atelectasis are ARDS and ERDS, and essentially what ends up happening here is something enters into that space for ARDS, so it's commonly blood entering into the alveoli, uh, could be um, water from uh, aspiration, and what that does is it dilutes or destroys the surfactant and causes the atelectasis. Now, uh, so let's say foreign fluid. Infant respiratory distress syndrome is atelectasis, um, and that's brought on by if the child is, is born very early, uh, premature, um, they haven't created surfactant yet because your lungs are the last thing to uh, evolve in, in that child or to grow in that child because they don't need the lungs while they're in utero, right? So the lungs are the last thing to use. So if the child is premature, the lungs might not have been developed. So let's put preemie. Okay, so it can be some significant problems. There's a, a lot of gas laws, and if you take critical care later on, you'll learn all the gas laws, or if you're looking to fly, you'll learn a lot of all the gas laws. So there's a couple um, gas laws we want to look at here uh, because we use some terms that are associated with it. So the first gas law is Boyle's law, Boyle's law. And that's going to be pressure is inversely proportionate to volume. Right, and I think of boils as a bottle. Right, so if we have a bottle and we have a certain volume in it, like a plastic bottle, and you squeeze that bottle, the pressure uh, inside the bottle is going to increase. Right, so the volume, if I squeeze the bottle, if the volume goes down, the volume of the size of the container goes down, so uh, container that would cause pressure to increase. Right. So inverse relationship. And then there's Henry's law. And Henry's law is, is also known as the Heineken law, right? So think of like Heineken, the beer. So this is the amount of gas that's dissolved in a liquid. Gas dissolved in a liquid. And so this brings to us partial pressure of gases. Boyle's law, if we were to use it on deploy it on a slide a few minutes ago, Boyle's Law is what we were looking at when the person is going to inhale or exhale, right? Inhalation, exhalation. So Boyle's Law would say that if the person takes a deep breath in, takes a deep breath in, <sighs> inhalation, they open up the volume, right? If they open up the volume in the lungs, what happens to our pressure relative to the outside? It's a vacuum, so it's negative. Larger volume, less pressure. 
boom, in action. So the re re reason I think of this with Heineken's law, as I call it, Henry's law, um, is that when we're talking about this, if this is gas dissolved in a liquid, think of uh, your Heineken, your beer, your soda pop, uh, sparkling water. They force gas, primarily CO2, into those things or through the uh, fermentation process, CO2 is produced, and that allows for the bubble and freshness and all of those things. And when you open the top, the bubbles come out, right? So when we're looking at the partial pressure of something, partial pressure is going to be looking at one gas versus the total of other gases. So let's look at air, the air we breathe. Air is not made only of oxygen, right? So inside air we have things like oxygen, uh, we probably have, we have some nitrogen and maybe some argon floating around, but they're not very important biologically. Uh, and then we've got CO2, probably to some lesser degree CO, unless we have some really significant issues there. And so that's the total pressure, right? This is total pressure. Total pressure. Now, if we were to look at oxygen's pressure, concentration inside all of this total pressure, that would be a partial pressure of oxygen, right? So partial pressure of oxygen. And so when we look at partial pressure, something that you might see is going to be something like PaO2, and that's the partial pressure of oxygen, big A, in an artery or arterial blood, right? That's what we're looking at. Now, we can look at partial pressures of CO2 and all those other things, but we primarily look at partial pressures of oxygen. All right, so that consumed a lot of our time and explanation. So here's some simpler things to think about. Uh, so we do need to memorize this term. This is going to be minute volume. And minute volume is pretty simple. The amount of volume of air, we're not necessarily looking primarily of oxygen, unless we're giving 100% oxygen, um, that's moved into and out of the lungs in one minute. So we can calculate that pretty easily, right? Volume of air in one minute. So that would be our volume times our ventilatory rate, right? Or you could say respiratory rate. And that equals minute volume, all right? So what would our normal, normal minute volume be? So we want to answer that with, number one, what's our tidal volume in the average adult? Okay, so we're probably looking 450 to 500 as a range, okay? Remember your water bottle in class, 450 to 500, total tidal volume. That's not one lung, that's two lungs specifically, okay? So let's say that we have a tidal volume of 450 times a normal ventilatory rate of 12. So this would give us our minute volume. So 450 times 12, I'll let you do the math it back to me. And that's the total amount. You'll probably convert it to liters that the person is breathing in and out in a minute. Now let's look at something. Let's assume the ventilatory rate stays the same, right? So this, this identifies tidal volume, this abbreviation. So if we decrease 250 times our normal ventilatory rate, 12, what's our volume now? Right. Significantly less significantly less. Okay, so this is something that tells us a little bit about how ventilatory rate and our volume that the person is breathing uh, has changed. So we've got qualifiers here, right? So when you take, oops, when you take a ventilatory rate, ventilatory rate, it is reported with a number, and then you're going to talk about ven ventilations per minute, and then you're going to talk about something like the depth, right? And then effort, and so our depths are generally going to be things like normal, or how about shallow? How about deep? Okay, so this would be what? That would be shallow, not enough ventilation. So some ventilatory compensation mechanisms and some questions that go with it. So if we look at patient number one, a tidal volume of 500, and a ventilatory rate of 12, that's just a little bit more than we had talked about in the previous slide. Um, but when we're looking at that, I'll let you do the calculation here. Uh, for simplicity, you can use your calculator. 
All right, so probably looking at six liters is moved in one minute, right? Six liters per minute. Now let's look at patient number two, so 250, and now let's say because the patient, if we had 250, and we identified in the previous slide, 250 times 12 is inadequate, right? So this is, this is normal, 250 times 12 is inadequate. The person probably has to find some means of increasing the amount of air in one minute that's moving through the lungs. And so if they can't, so let's say that this can't be ch can't changed, this can, right? So minute volume minute volume equals tidal volume times ventilatory rate, right? So what do we get for that? Previously, we saw a dramatically lower number, but since we increased the ventilatory rate, this person is now moving 7.5 liters. That should be what you got per minute. But there's an interesting thing that happens here, right, per minute. That person is moving 7.5 liters per minute. But if they're not breathing deeply, what happens? Do we get air into the alveoli? Probably not. So when we're looking at this, we can identify that these patients um, may or may not be hypoventilated. But if we're looking not at the rate, but just the depth of the mechanism, then they are. And we would say, are these patients hypoxic? Patient number one is probably not hypoxic, but patient number two will be, will be, because oxygen is not making its way into the larger number of alveoli to exchange gases, even though, if we're looking at this, true story, this is ventilation, right? And ventilation can impact respiration. Now we need to take into account anatomical dead space, right? So in our abbreviations, we had V little t, and that's our tidal volume, right? And then our dense space, V with a D. So when we're looking at uh, our normal adult tidal volume, we're looking about 150 milliliters. I'm sorry, our dead space. And dead space is going to be essentially, dead space is going to be our airways, our non-respiratory. So this would be airways, which is our conducting zone, right? That's not important to us, really. It's really not. Because if we want air to get into the lungs, um, then we would have to, to, to cause respiration. We've got to get deeply into the lungs. All right. So we move back here and we were identify these, we would see a whole different set now of parameters for our patients, all right? Because we would remove 150 from that volume. So in reality, in reality, this patient, this patient here is receiving not 250 milliliters, but 100 milliliters. That's not very much. Look at your bottle. A fifth of that bottle is 100 milliliters. All right, moving through this a little bit more quickly now as we kind of get close to the end of this. Uh, so pulmonary ventilation volumes are important. We do need to know this bigger picture here, and you're going to get this in respiratory, and you're going to get this in um, your uh, human systems lecture. So I want to identify just a couple things, right? You've got inspiratory reserve volume. You have your normal tidal volume. And then you've got expiratory reserve volume and then the residual. Okay, these are reserves. You can recruit these. Residual, you can't recruit. And so in the larger picture, we have something called vital capacity. And vital capacity, uh, I'm sorry, the vital capacity doesn't include that. Vital capacity is going to be this range and not this range because this is not available for you to use, right? So if we look at this, we've got three liters. We've got now 3.5 liters, we've got 4.5 liters, and then we finish off with basically 6.7 liters. That's the entire chest cavity, right? So about 6 liters is your entire, entire chest cavity volume, which is how much blood could be held in that space. Okay, so let's not look at just necessarily this here. What I want you to do is you know that this is just taking a normal breath, 
What I want you to do though is inspiratory reserve volume. Take in a normal breath and then take a breath in as though you're going to hold your breath and go underwater and you gotta hold it for a while. Take a normal breath in. Now maybe more. That's your inspiratory reserve volume. You're recruiting that, okay? Now, if we were going to get our expiratory reserve, reserve volume, we exhale like normal, and then do that thing like we did a little bit earlier where you exhale forcefully. <sighs> so you have now gotten rid of the gases in the expiratory reserve volume. Okay, so when we're getting rid of gases in the expiratory reserve volume, remind me, this is exhalation, and we had to recruit what muscles to do that? A normally passive process, we're recruiting at that point internal intercostal muscles. Great. Now I'm going to give you uh, just a little bit of, oops, misspelling, cross that out, metabolism, right? So very down and dirty. You don't need to know all these crazy pathways. Um, what I want you to know is you got your mitochondria. For some reason, it always look like a piece of bread, I think. Um, but you have two components for effect, effective metabolism, primarily. We're going to use glucose, and we're going to use O2 right? And if O2 is present, we're using aerobic metabolism. And what is spit out of this thing, spat out of this thing, is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that's our energy. Energy. We generally get about 36 ATP. And there's going to be a byproduct coming out of this process, and that's CO2. Now, if we convert, for our sakes, for airway and ventilation, to anaerobic, and aerobic, and we assume that everything else is working fine, so we have glucose, we have no O2, glucose goes in, right, we would create CO2, and the process, our goal is to create ATP. All right. So what ends up happening in this inefficient process is without oxygen inside the cell, right? This is the mitochondria. The mitochondria. If we don't have oxygen, we're going to spit out about four pieces, four chunks of ATP versus our 36, right? And we also create more acids. Now, for simplistic sake, we can think of the acids as being lactic acid, but acids are going to change the way cells work, and they change the way proteins work, enzymes and the such. So acid being released into the cell by this inefficient process eventually will kill the cell. The cell dies, it lyses, it breaks open, and the contents of the cell now go into interstitial space, and that causes interstitial space now to become toxic, and assuming the rest of the tissue doesn't have oxygen there either, it now has a bunch of cells popping, and when they pop and, and explode their contents, they create a zone of death throughout that tissue. So that's important to know uh, because we need efficient metabolism. So if you think about it, when a person is, go person is going through shock, right, we have inadequate cellular perfusion, we have now sent them into anaerobic, not we, but their condition is anaerobic metabolism. All right, so anaerobic metabolism, no O2, lots of acid. And if you think of a person who's in shock, they really, really need this to do work, right? So that's a problem. So how would we fix that? We would supply oxygen, right? Very simple. This is really how it all works. And then when we supply the oxygen, we do need to consider our FIC principles, right? So I'm going to assume that you remember your FIC principles. But in order to get the tissue uh, perfused right here, right, so that we can have metabolism inside our mitochondria, we want to make sure that along this entire process we have functioning FIC principles so that O2 can make its way into the cell. All right. Pathophysiology. Uh, we're getting kind of close to the end of this uh, video. Pathophysiology. So really a decreased ATP is going to cause a low pH result, which is acidotic, and autodigestion is going to occur, cellular edema, and loss of intravascular volume. Intravascular volume. Well, that's really, really bad because intravascular volume, IV volume, equals a BP, and if it's decreased in here, it will be decreased in here, 
which is shock. Oxygenation pathophysiology, there's lots of different reasons that we can have a decreased amount of oxygen floating through. And so we really classify those into a few things. And if you think about it, here's FIC principles, right? So impaired pulmonary systemic circulation. Circulation is going to be FIC principle one, two, three, right? Pulmonary embolism, blocking blood flow to the lungs. Shock, just lower volume altogether. Decreased distance for gas, increased distance for gas diffusion. So this is going to impact, if we're looking at the respiratory membrane, this is going to impact FIC principle 2. And then inability of red blood cells to offload oxygen at tissue. This is FIC principle 4, right? So FIC principles. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to skip Socrative just for time's sake, but when blood is more alkalotic, how does hemoglobin behave? Remember, I verbally said this in class. All right, so given time, our answer is actually going to be oxygen delivery when we have Blood that is more alkalotic than normal, so it's going to be probably greater than 7.45, right? Moving our way to basic as pH. Oxygen delivery is going to be decreased because the proteins are now more tightly wound. This would be increase, number two, so this is our ding, 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 ding. Oxygen delivery is decreased because it is more loosely wound, that chemical. So more loosely wound is decreased, but that's going to equal acidotic. That's why that dotic is not right. No change. Well, there's been a change, so let's just call that a dumb selection. All right. Oxygen delivery is increased because it's more tightly wound. That is false because it wouldn't be increased. More loosely wound, false because it wouldn't be increased. All right, so we're left with oxygen delivery is decreased because it's more tightly wound and alkalotic. Now I wanna bring this up because I'm gonna bring a very brief presentation. You need to see this a few times, but this is our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and it could also be something associated with CO2 as well. It's just gas dissociation, but we're looking at partial pressures. So our partial pressures, so some things we're looking at. SpO2, right? So this is a saturation pressure of oxygen, but this is looking at a whole bunch of cells, lots of cells, as they pass by the infrared reflector and reflecting light, excuse me, reflecting light as it goes through the bloodstream. Okay, so these are SpO2 values like you know. These are going to be partial pressures in capillaries. That's kind of where we're going to leave that for now. And I'm going to oversimplify this just so it makes a little bit of sense. Okay. So when we're looking at pressures, these pressures differ in different parts of cells. And we'll see that on the next slide. But let's just assume that this is a cell inside your kidney. And we want to keep our kidneys perfused, right? So when we're looking at getting oxygen to the kidney, we have to take into account all the FIC principles, right? So those are all true. So what we're looking at here in the sigmoid, this is a sigmoid design of a graph, right? So we've got our x and y axis defined. What we're seeing here is the rapid response when we decrease pressures inside a cell, is what we're looking at perhaps, the capillaries, we decrease pressures and what that equivalent SpO2 is, okay? So there's a few things here that I kind of want to point out a little bit. This is, again, super simplified here. This is essentially a roller coaster. So think about watching a roller coaster or having been on one. Here's our roller coaster car. Whee! There it is. Got some happy people. Yeah. What's up, dog? No hands. All right. So they're hanging out and they're on the roller coaster. They've already made it to the top. Yeah, so that happened. They already made it to the top. And remember, at the top of the roller coaster, it kind of just cruises a little bit, almost a flat line. And imagine how slowly you go down that, right? The anticipation is building. Well, you get to a certain point where the line goes down. And so this doesn't have anything to do with gravity, always, obviously, but we're, you know, roll with it on my roller coaster. Once you get to a certain point, you speed up, right? And once you speed up, 
you go faster and faster as you go down this roller coaster. Okay, so think about that for just a moment. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, what this means is this is the rate of oxygen dissociating from hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can, bol can hold on to oxygen in four different sites per hemoglobin. Okay, so that means that each of these binding sites is worth 25%. Okay. Now, something else that I kind of add in here, and it's not necessarily part of it, is when we're looking at just an aggregate, if a bunch of these cells have binding sites, we can actually break this down in saturation to about, uh, I'm sorry, to about 75, 50% saturation, and 25. All right. So if we're looking at 25% saturation, that would mean over here, that all these sites are open and O2 is only here. Now, as a protein, uh, hemoglobin changes its shape based on the number of binding sites. That is to say that, uh, if I can write this here, uh, hemoglobin, that's our abbreviation for hemoglobin, its affinity for oxygen binding increases with the number of already bound sites. Hemoglobin binding to oxygen increases as the number of binding sites is increased. So simplistically, hemoglobin that has 75% binding, it lost one oxygen molecule from its four binding sites, so there's three still left, will hold on to and pick up oxygen more easily than the site that only has one and three open sites. It's kind of crazy, but that's the confirmation change that occurs. Uh, and a little bit counterintuitive, I'll give you that. Okay, so here's where this becomes important, okay? So remember, this is fast. Now, if this roller coaster goes down and there's brakes, the brakes will have an easier time stopping here than it does down here, right, because of that dis that, that uh, gravity. So let's think of that as dissociation. Here's our hemoglobin cruising around. It gets to about 75. Anything below 75, we decrease hemoglobin's affinity to hold on to oxygen. Okay, so we're barreling down. So a concept now. So hold on to this idea. I ask you a question. For those of you with field experience, is it easier or harder, how does it compare to get a person with 100% oxygen uh, that you're providing for them, partial arm rebreather mask, uh, is it harder or easier to get the person with that amount of oxygen from 70 to 75 in your experience or 60 to 70 um, versus getting somebody from 90 to 100? time-wise, perhaps. That's the difficulty. Well, with experience, you find that patients that start to desat, their saturations are going to decline. Desatting patients, the lower their value, the harder it is for us to catch up. Okay, so here it is. Brakes are harder to stop this thing, and certainly if we wanted to move back up, it would be a lot harder than it is here. Okay, so keep that in mind. Oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve shows us we have four binding sites. We have pressures. This is a pressure between spaces, right? So if we've got a cell and a blood vessel, for example, oxygen saturation. And because of this dissociation, once one falls off and two falls off, they all fall off much more quickly, and it's harder to get binding or to send a roller coaster back up. Okay, this is important because what this is telling us in my crazy roller coaster world is that when a patient starts to desat, it's harder for us to catch up. Okay, and that's with providing 100% oxygen, maybe BVM partial non rebreather. And because of that, we want to make sure that when we intubate a patient, which takes time, they stop breathing for the time period that you know we're breathing for them for the time period that we get that tube and maybe make some mistakes there and have to start over again, that's okay. You may not get it on the first try. Every patient's different in their condition. Um, Pre-oxygenation gives us the ability to hopefully, in time, increase from this area here 
to an area up here where it's going to take longer to dissociate. So here's the war story, okay? So when I intubated my first patient in the OR, I had a tremendous um, nurse anesthetist who was visiting. This nurse anesthetist uh, knew this was my first tube, and he was a paramedic before, so he kind of understood these things. We had a patient that was waiting to get intubated, um, had been sedated, and, you know, just kind of standard prep stuff. And what we did on this patient was an RSI. What, what my preceptor did was an RSI. So there I am ready. I've got the tube all set. I've got my laryngoscope handle in my hand. The light's, you know, been checked. It's bright and uh, tight and to the right. So it's all set. I've got my backup stuff set up. I'm feeling good. I got stylus. There's a BVM nearby. We're ready to rock and roll. So he pushes the paralytic drug, which stops the diaphragm and intercostal muscles from working, among other things. So the person stops breathing. The patient had been pre-oxygenated, and their O2 sat was 99 to 100%. So instead of me thinking, oh man, this happened, I only have 30 seconds to get it done for my skill sheet, he pauses me and says, just wait. And we waited two minutes for the oxygen saturation to decline from 100 to just about 90. Now, once we hit 90, he said, hurry up and intubate, right? So no pressure. But what's interesting about that is because the patient had been pre-oxygenated, it bought more time to keep that sat upright, right? On the right, on the positive side of giving oxygen. So when we hold their breath for them by stopping ventilation, we have a little bit more time and perhaps that means better outcomes for our patients than if we don't pre-oxygenate, okay? So this is looking at gas exchange and essentially oxyhemoglobin dissociation. So what I do want to point out, this is the alveoli and this is the red blood cell. The red blood cell here is the artery, so it's returning from this. And I'm just going to make up numbers, basically. So let's say that the oxygen partial pressure inside this red blood cell here is going to be 28 millimeters of mercury or tor. And inside the alveoli, for providing 100% oxygen, then the partial pressure should be basically 99 to 100%, right? So let's say that that pressure equates to about 50 millimeters of mercury. What do we say about our concentration of pressures? Well, there's the reason oxygen goes in to the red blood cell. And we can conversely say that because this came from the body, CO2, CO2 is a higher pressure here than it is here, right? Because our partial pressure inside the alveoli for us, uh, P alveolar, is going to probably be nearly 100%. So there's no CO2. So CO2 moves in that direction, right? The pressure and the concentration of oxygen impact how we on, on and offload our oxygen. Well, let's look at cells here. So we have now fully bound. So let's say the pressure of this red blood cell by the time it gets to the pinky toe is probably 42 or so, right? And inside the cell, because the cell needs has, has used oxygen and created CO2 in metabolism, inside, inside the cell maybe this is 20. Oxygen is going to diffuse into that cell because of just normal diffusion gradients because the pressure and the concentration are higher than what's in the cell, okay? So here's our pre-oxygenation. According to the things that you're going to read and according to skill sheets and skills drills, our best day if we're intubating somebody is going to be able to is going to be spending time with the BVM, ventilating the patient for at least two minutes on 100% oxygen. Right? And why was that? So that we buy ourselves a little bit more time to intubate before they desat. If you try to intubate somebody, just and it may happen because of circumstances, if you try to intubate somebody and they're at a 70, they're going to desat to 60 really, really quick. Right, And so you don't have a lot of time to get this tube in. So you want to build that for success. And if you think about, whoa, two minutes, how am I going to do that? I thought we said 30 seconds is the longest we could go without a tube, blah, blah, blah. Remember, you're ventilating these patients. But the other idea is when you get on scene, you identify somebody who's not breathing adequately, you can BVM right away. Now we have to set up all of our equipment to intubate. And that could take two minutes, perhaps, or a little bit longer, depending on what's going on.
All right. And because of this, BLS skills are essential. So you're going to want to put in that OPA. The reason we put that OPA in before we intubate is so it splints the airway open while we ventilate so that we can build up our pre-oxygenation saturation. All right. So essential skills for airway management. All right, so your essential skills are going to include your BLS stuff. And why are these skills important? If you can't do the BLS, the patient isn't going to have success with ALS skills. I mean, if you can't perform it, you know, physically yourself. All right, so we see, we listen, we feel, or we look, we listen, we feel, and we have some terms for this, right? So we've got observation slash inspection on this one. Palpation, gentle chest rise, listening for clear lung sounds, and looking for gentle chest rise, right? Inadequate breathing reasons. So some of the things we need to take a point of. Orthopnea. So this is going to be dyspnea based on the patient's position. Right? Maybe this person lays down flat. They're sitting upright. They lay down flat, and they have a hard time breathing. Uh, flared nostrils is an indicator. Purse lip breathing, which is going to give us PEEP, which we'll talk about shortly. Retractions, accessory muscles. Asymmetric chest wall movement is a concern. And just increased work of breathing. Increased work of breathing. Now, our range is generally going to be 12 to 20 breaths per minute. You'll see different values here and there, but that's what we're really looking at. Irregular rhythms are concerning because the brain has probably been impacted. Abdominal or seesaw breathing. Uh, reduced flow of that, that oxygen and, and gases out. Uh, let's see. Staccato speech. So that's someone who's speaking in short sentences. So we want to feel for air movement, observe for its symmetry, note any paradoxical motion, which means that one side moves versus opposite the other side. And then we're going to assess for something called pulsus paradoxus. And pulsus paradoxus is present in, in some degree in a lot of patients that are out there. And what we're looking at is measuring their blood pressure while they breathe. And so pulsus paradoxus, you'll feel when you feel for a pulse. When they take a uh, deep breath in, their blood pressure drops 10 millimeters of mercury. And let's think about that, right? So our vena cava traveling to the heart, superior, uh, inferior, those two structures are all kind of squeezed within our lungs, right? Squeezed within the lungs. And so when a person takes a deep breath in, remember the chest wall moves out and the diaphragm moves down. That puts pressure on these blood vessels and it impedes the flow of blood back to the heart. So normal findings are less than 10 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure during inhalation. And again, you'll feel this. You could feel your pulse right now. Find a not radial pulse on yourself. Deep breath in. It might become a little bit faint depending on your hydration status uh, and this, but it's an abnormal concerning finding in pulses paradoxus with 10 millimeters over. All right. So looking at history, what's our onset? What's the trigger? What's the duration? What's our mechanism for trauma? Um, we're going to intervent. Uh, what interventions have been done in the past, and were they hospitalized? And what are the risk factors? A note on terminology as we wrap up this slide. So we're going to talk about hypoxia versus hypoxemia because they're two specifically different terms. So hypoxemia is low oxygen bound to hemoglobin. So that means it's not available to travel around. Hypoxia is low oxygen inside the tissue. And that's the term we use a lot, right? The patient is hypoxic. And that means they're probably going without oxygen to their brain. Note that hypoxemia can cause hypoxia. And hypoxia could cause hypoxemia, but it probably was, you know, the causative agent. All right, we're going to stop right there for a break. This is uh, the first part. Now we're going to move on to intubation, which is a pretty lengthy lecture. So I want you to take a quick stretch break, maybe five to ten minutes at the most, and we'll get started with the next slide.